and stretch. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I've been trying to practice a hold face for when the Zoom pops in. There's always that slightly awkward moment when you kind of, is it on, is it not on? It's not quite as awkward as the end frame when you're fumbling for the, the stop button, but uh, you know, it's something I think we should all be better at this end of the pandemic. Anyway, good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 season premiere of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival's Industry Forum series. My name is Pat Nurse and I'm the creative director of the festival. And <clears throat> pardon me, it's my pleasure to, uh, it's my pleasure to be your host uh, in this first forum. Um, if you've tuned in to our forums before and caught my excellent lead in forum faces, you may notice some changes in today's session. For one thing, we've got a great new sponsor on board for the series. Please welcome Mr. Yum to the table, uh, Melbourne's favorite cashless payment system. Uh, alongside our longtime principal partner, Bank of Melbourne, and our destination partner, Visit Victoria. You might also notice that rather than coming at you from my lounge room or study or spare room with a dress shirt laid over the top of my sweatpants, I am in fact wearing real clothes and I'm beaming at you live from beautiful downtown Docklands at the festival headquarters. Here at Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, we're also kicking off our March edition in nine days. 12 hours, 30 minutes and counting with two weeks of activity ahead of a celebration of Melbourne in winter and then a festival all about regional Victorian food and drink in the spring. All of which is to say things are getting back to normal, sort of. Vaccinations are rolling out, borders are opening and closing and opening again. And so are restaurants. And while it might seem like a pandemic is the time when you want to batten down the hatches. Today, we're joined by three Victorian restaurateurs who have decided that the time was right to open a new restaurant. Uh, Kate Bartholomew, the seasoned operator behind Coda and Tonka, has just opened a new Coda in Lawn. Kate might be, oh, Kate is just beaming in as I speak. It's like I've magically summoned her. We'll, we'll... Oh my God. Oh my God, we're live, Kate. Oh. That was harder than opening a restaurant. Oh, see, this is, this is unscripted. This is the magic. Oh, of, uh, Jesus, of I'm so movement. sorry. That's oh, okay. my God. There were three I of us just, freaking out. Oh, God. I was just introducing you and saying how good you were at Zoom. <laughs> so, um, I'm wave, so sorry, you, everybody. Oh, no, my God. How embarrassing. I was just <gasps> singing your praises. So if you wave and take a time, a moment to catch your breath, I'll introduce Oh, guys, you. forgive me. Welcome, I'm sorry. Kate. Not at all. Thank you. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> we're also, we're, we're, what an entrance. Uh, Scott, would you like to have um, a do over? Or would you like to pop up from behind a desk or something? I'm, just, I'm sitting at my desk in my office, Pat, uh, in, in the top of Estelle in Northcote, actually, which I've I had for almost 10 years, the office and Estelle. So, no, I'm happy here. I think Kate's having a bit of trouble with Wi-Fi down the peninsula probably or down the coast, the surf coast. Yeah, I just suck at this. So I'm pleased those, to see you. For those of you who don't know Scott, um, he's a, a veteran chef and restaurateur, you know, a, a very well-known figure in the Melbourne food and wine scene who has uh, just opened not one but two new CBD establishments during the pandemic, taking over uh, Long Grain and also launching a new Little Collins eatery, uh, Chancery Lane, one of the best places I have eaten in 2021. Uh, and then round out our panel is Florian Ribble, a chef with experience at the likes of the Clove Club in London and Neighbourhood Wine right here in Melbourne, who has just opened Vex Dining in Westgarth with his fellow chef Rory Kennedy and partner Owen Probert. Hello, Flo. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm guessing that if you're in the audience, you've probably been on a Zoom before, maybe not. You know, maybe maybe you're uh, new like Kate, but there's some <laughs> bottom where you can actually pose questions directly to us while we're in the session. We're going to be running for between half an hour and an hour. So, you know, if there's something you'd like to say, please, by all means, jump on the chat down the bottom there and uh, you can pose questions to us as we go along. But um, otherwise, really, we're here to sort of tease out what the business of opening in 2021 is all about. Is it crazy? Is it a great idea? Is it a great idea that's crazy? 
what are the practicalities? Uh, why don't we jump in with you, Kate Bartholomew? Kate, <laughs> this is not the first order <clears throat> that you've opened. What was yes. the, can you talk us through the, the opening of Coda Lawn? Was it in any way different to opening the first Coda? Yes, we opened the first Coda in the recession um, in the GFC. So that, you know, posed a lot of challenges. And I think I was 24 at the time and I'd never really known debt like that or that feeling of complete, just zero money, you know, no money whatsoever. So in this time around, I had a little bit of money, but not much because uh, one of the restaurants that, that I opened a few years ago failed and we lost a significant amount of money. So there was a lot that was similar about opening Coda Lawn to opening Melbourne. I was still broke and, um, and it was hard and the, and the circumstances around opening it were really difficult. But I think the things that have been great is that we're now regional so we've kind of followed our customers, if you like, given the pandemic. Um, but coming to a regional place, it, it's so much harder than we thought getting staff and accommodation. Um, it's, it's, un, it's actually unbelievable, unbelievably hard. And, it was, and that, that was something that was very difficult pre-pandemic. Uh, yes. It's been massively exacerbated. I mean, staff, staff has always been a challenge. <laughs> staff is a challenge everywhere. Let's, we should probably just put that on the table right now. I mean, yeah. we were having this conversation in 2019, the number one problem that everyone would be facing here would be getting staff. And now yeah. we're at that point, minus 10,000 staff. You know, but um, yeah, I guess as you say, it's even more challenging in in the regions. Just talk us through for those of us who aren't familiar with with Coda Lawn. Where are you? So we're on the top of the Lawn Hotel, which is sort of on the main street next to the Cumberland. Remember that that uh, hotel that caused all of that controversy? Anyway, we're sort of how many next seats are we? What how how does we're, it resemble Coda Melbourne? We're big. We're, we're one hundred and twenty. One hundred and twenty. So we're more like Tonka's size, big. Um, but we're about to do the deck in sort of mid-year, which will be make it huge, which terrifies me. But we're going to sort of have an oyster bar out there and it's got this amazing view of this ocean. God, it's beautiful. Um, and so it's really big. And Movida, who are kind of like our cousins, are on the base, on the ground floor, and then the bistro, and then we're on the top. Um, so feeling very lucky. What um, Was this a, a, a move that you had in train before the onset of coronavirus? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. We did a pop-up here because Movita said, you've got to come down. And we just had this crazy drunk week with awesome customers. And it was just a big party for everyone that dined, I hope. And we never thought we'd be invited back to do another one. I mean, we really had a good time. And they said a couple of weeks later, do you guys want to come back and maybe open a restaurant? And we were like, oh, my God, we behave so badly. So it was remarkable, actually. And we sort of ummed and art about it. And then the pandemic hit. And the focus then became about how are we going to stop Coda and Tonka going under? Um, and, and sort of all of that, all of our energy went into that. And suddenly, as we started to entertain the idea, in our current situation, we were not required to provide any capital. So none of our money went into it. And it was deal. kind of... So pro tip for anyone listening, that's yeah. a good deal. <laughs> so honestly like it it was a no-brainer like we we were like we've got to do something the city's closed down and it's an amazing thing to be doing it's so fun the guys in the pub are awesome and it, I feel really lucky but not the first time you've opened in heavy weather yes correct yeah yeah what were the, what were the lessons that you took away from having opened in a recession um, I think basically, and I, I, I the, the most important thing for me to be was creative. For example, if anyone's been to Coda, the lights are made out of chicken wire, you know, that were just something that was found at the tip. The guys, Projects Imagination, created these lights overnight and they really became this kind of, uh, kind of this iconic piece in that restaurant for me and something so simple as that that could be made out of nothing um really it's just about being creative I don't think you need a lot of money and then we went out and did Tonka which was an outrageously expensive fit out and I and I did exactly the opposite to what I'd learned with Coda so now coming back into it with Oter we had no money so we did it again on no money and then Coda Law and we've done it with a bit of money but just create just being creative I think in all aspects of the business particularly interior design, which I'm really into. 
Florian, you, you've come at this from a different angle. I mean, Scott and Kate have opened, you know, a couple of restaurants and, and a couple being a significant understatement. Is this the first place you've opened as a, you know, as a partner in the business? As a partner, yes. Um, I've done a couple of openings as a, as a chef, um, which doesn't give you a full perspective, of course. Like, you, you know, I, by the last time I, I was able to sort of start digging a little bit deeper, which was sort of about me just researching for my own sake. Yeah. You, you're never really going to get the full scope of what's to come, you know. Um, and this is probably an extreme example of that opening in, in COVID. I mean, when, when had you guys hoped to open VEX? Is VEX a product of the pandemic or is VEX something you had on the go before the spicy cough gained its foothold in the world? So, I mean, weirdly, when, when I look back on everything, because I've just been going through, through all my notes and my notebooks, getting ready for this, um, Rory and I founded VEX like four years ago. Um, we wrote our first business plans back then. We started, Do you still have the coaster? We've got, got it all. Got it all. It's uh, <laughs> boxes of crap. It's uh, really funny, though. You know, we, we went through the process of writing business plans, doing a lot of modeling, doing all the base stuff well before we were ever ready to start looking, which we still did, you know, um, and talked about money as if we knew what we were talking about. <laughs> um, so next thing you know, the last year, November, was the, uh, no, the 2019 November was when we looked at the space the first time. Um, and just, in- just for people who aren't familiar with the restaurant, describe where you guys are in Westgarth. We're on the very, I guess the very start of High Street in the uh, north, get t- closest to the city. Um, we are a 50 seater, which we can't use all of obviously right now, but um, just a really small venue that used to be a, used to be a cafe. Um, and we've just kept that quite simple. Um, simple food and wine venue. And so 2019, you're looking at the space, it's looking good. Yeah, look, got rejected. I think there's a pandemic around the corner. I haven't really lived through a plague before. We got, we got lucky. We got lucky. We were rejected from the space initially um, by the uh, landlord. And yeah, um, so we got rejected and I decided to go back and start again in January. And this time with a couple, you know, a bit more advice with me. And we ended up getting getting offered the space and the business that was in there previously. And um, then everything kind of you know, went to shit. Hit the fan, I think we say. Yeah, absolutely. And um, had you it, signed a lease at that stage? We had signed the heads of agreement and paid some of the you know the obligatory one month rent to secure it. Uh, and that was all we would have lost at that point in time. But um, we realised during the pandemic when we were working for other people and. Um, you know, helped helped other venues transition into this COVID uh, concept that they all became. Um, but we would actually rather take that time to just do this, actually just go ahead with it. Um, we sort of thought that, you know, it's, things are unclear, but if we keep stuff in check and, you know, take our time to fit it out the way we want, we could actually come out of this ready for when things were ready to reopen. And you opened end of 2019, exactly when? Uh, no, oh, 2020, I beg your pardon. We, we opened almost exactly a year later. So November 2020, we opened. Were there many points over the course of 2020 after you committed to do it where you thought, what are we doing? Why are we opening a, bus- a business during a pandemic? Like locked with lockdown two sort of, you know, put yeah. the wind up you or? We got, we got the keys on the first week of lockdown too. Um, that was when we picked up the keys and we started the fit out quietly, just the three of us um, tearing it apart, um, taking our time and um, starting to figure out what we could do with the very little amount of cash that we had. Um, we, you know, modeled a whole bunch of different ideas about, you know, this was about projections. This is about projections on figures that don't exist on, on yeah. a situation that we didn't know about. Um, and we basically just went, okay, base idea. We just want to do food and wine in-house. If that doesn't work, we're going to do this. Had a couple of different models that we thought we might be able to do in the meantime. Can you, would you be, would you be willing to share the details of what your, your pivot plans or your plans B and C looked like? 
yeah, it looked completely different. We decided that if we were going to open up as a, if we had to open up as a takeaway slash delivery venue or something like that to start off with, we didn't want that to reflect anything to do with what our actual restaurant concept was going to so be. So you wouldn't do Vex to go, you would no, do... No way. no way. No, we decided that we were going to keep those worlds separate if that was going to be the case. We would rather go out there and do something really fun and completely different that maybe has like a little bit of a twin, uh, a tinge of what we might become, but not really. No. Um, you know, I guess what we're trying to do in-house is very much an old school, we want to slow down the experience and let people really enjoy the timetable side and take care of them there. And there's just not really a way for us to represent that being a new venue. Um, I think that if you were an established venue and you can bring a good product to take home, that's awesome and you should do that. But for us, it was more like, you don't know us yet. People aren't mm. going to take a chance quite like, you know, established venues or good takeaway venues that are already doing it. And I mean, you, you've said you've obviously worked in restaurants during openings, even though they haven't been your restaurants. Was the experience of opening in the pandemic, albeit between lockdowns, thank goodness, in any way different? Or, you know, were people more enthusiastic, less enthusiastic? What was the response from your, your neighbourhood? Response has been great from the locals. We, um, we're sort of just starting to see it now about three months in to, to really notice the sort of repeat, uh, repeat clientele, uh, people that have been in, brought new people with them, really simple little like signs that are just showing that we kind of have a little bit of that um, a sort of locality, you know, which is kind of important during this pandemic, especially if you imagine the five kilometer radius, like realistically, that's the people that we want to be taking care yeah. of most anyway. That's your bread and butter right there. Mm. So, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, uh, we opened up uh, under the stricter limitations. Um, now we've had uh, a loosening of it. And as a new venue and new operators, that's absolutely perfect. Like that is a perfect, nice, gradual way to sort of mm. slip into becoming, you know, a, a, a not, like an operator and, you know, just adding a little bit more volume as we go along. Scott, I, I feel like you have a, a pretty good perspective on this from, you know, the other end of the same street, but also, I mean, what's the lay of the land with the uh, picket in Melbourne at the moment? You've, you've planted the flag a few places across town now. Bring us up to speed. Uh, well, I think as Flo said too, the thing that we're really seeing during the last 12 months, especially at Estelle, is the sense of community, the people, the locals, the 5K rule and stuff has been unbelievable really for us uh patch you know when this all hit you know to keep the wheels turning we decided we had you know a couple of big sort of full team meetings like like with all staff um and we just sat down and we said okay so what are we going to do about this how are we actually going to work through it, it wasn't just my decision it was one that i kind of had a core vision and a plan that i really wanted to do and we said okay so we're going to go to the takeaway model for estelle we wanted to and I wanted us to cook dishes. And I suppose, you know, as Flo pointed out too, I didn't want them to be Estelle dishes. I actually wanted us to have some fun and cook food that we never did. We probably would never serve in, in the restaurant itself. And we kind of tried to use it as a learning experience for the staff where we'd just pick up the LaRousse and we'd cook chicken a la king or we'd cook classics that you might never cook or think about serving, but actually just have some fun, you know, cooking really simple um you know, tasty food at a good price point. And the reception to that, um, as well as joining Provador too, which I was kind of in discussions with Shane already in the January or February pre-COVID. And I thought that that was another good angle for us pre all of this to actually leverage off our name, our brand, and maybe have some passive income and just do something different. So that was kind of already in the mix a little bit. But the way that the sort of, you know, the people of Northgate, look, I mean, they were coming in and thanking us for being open, thanking us for staying alive, thanking us for feeding them. And I was just really thankful they were coming through and actually, you know, on certain days, like on Mother's Day, actually queuing up down the street, you know, it was kind of, I've kind of had a really good COVID experience in some respects because I lived three minutes from Estelle. My life didn't change that much <coughs> um, aside from, really not really having customers in the restaurant dining, right? But I came to work every day, like every day from the 23rd of March, I worked through till Christmas day last year. And mm. okay, we took on long range and we built Chancery Lane, but to get out of the house and to keep myself motivated and moving and inspiring the team, I actually just came to work every day, nine o'clock. 
and there were graft. And, and I had a great six months in the kitchen again. I hadn't spent like 100% of my time actually just cooking. You know, a few wild videos, Digger Goes Rogue, went a little bit crazy midway there for a little bit. <laughs> and we just tried to have some fun with it. And really that's, you know, just cooking with the boys and just grafting again was actually really, really good fun. And then at the start, we kind of sat down and we said, either there's two ways this could go. Either we just, you know, we actually make those really hard financial decisions and we stand everyone down, we trim it down to the bare bones and that's it. And that sort of wasn't my preference. Or as a team and as a unit, you know, we share the pain, you know, we all take a bit of a hit and then we just get through this as a, as a large group, as a team, really. And that was, you know, you know, that was the option in our first staff meeting of 187 people that every single person voted for that. And then I said, if there's some that have got kids that have got sort of more responsibility, you know, they've got mortgages. If there's guys that have, you know, like, like a bit of spare, you know, a bit of spare cash saved, you know, they came to me one-on-one -on -one and said, Chef, oh, I really need, you know, four or five days work. And I had some guys that had been with me six or seven years and said, Chef, oh, I've got 10 grand in the bank. I'll just take, you know, like a month off without pay and give my days to that guy that needs it. So to see the way that the team actually went through that and we actually didn't have to lay one staff member off. I mean, the casuals kind of filtered out um, early on in sort of, you know, in March or April, you know, leaving and not having the work and stuff. And then we probably had about uh, 25 to 30 kind of internationals that kind of made the decision between March and June to go home, uh, back to France, back to Sweden, back to Italy, back to the States. Uh, but the core group left of, of sort of just under 100 of us actually just worked so well as a team together. And I mean, some, you know, like there were a few crazy weeks there during Mother's Day, Father's Day, big events where we actually had seven days work. And we just had so much on through Providor, through Takeaway, through Matilda, and then building long grain again. And then other weeks there were one or two days work. So we just said, okay, everyone gets paid for the time that they work. It's easy. We go through. And it was wonderful that it really sort of happened like that. You know, if I had to be honest with you, it's a, it was an inspiring thing to see how people in adversity can really band together. And it restored a little bit of my faith in people themselves too. You know what I mean? They're, they're just, you know, they're looking after the guy next to them. And some people knew some people, you know, the second lockdown, um, we decided not to do Matilda. Um, it was just a little bit too hard. It was, you know, from a logistical sense and cash flow sense, it was too much. And so we brought everyone up to Estelle and then we had really good fun doing it, actually. We kind of worked on stuff around the restaurants. We did some cleaning, we did some building, we did menu development. And that's really what I did in second lockdown when kind of we'd already settled on long grain is I spent three months there every day just cooking with the guys and learning a new cuisine that I, that I'm definitely not a master in Thai food. That's for sure. But I've got a good base understanding of it. I've got a much better understanding now after six months of working with the team a lot. And I've, and it's given me time to read and taste and develop stuff and to mentor young people coming through. So, you know, then we built Chancery Lane as well too, which kind of popped up during the thing. So, you know, if I can probably a little bit crazy, Pat, but I think that there's some, uh, hopefully there's some good reward at the end of all of this risk and where things are at too. But map, map it out for us, Scott. Where, where are your businesses in Melbourne in, in 2021 today? What have, what have you got open? And so Stell's open in in High Street, Northcote. That's traded the whole way through. Lupo, that's the old St. Crispin. We actually closed that. And that just for the return, the turnover on a smaller little farm business, that wasn't worth it. That actually became, became what we kind of call base camp. Yeah. And sort of Rob Kabord, um, Alex, you know, the restaurant managers, there's six or eight staff that came on board for Chancery Lane. They actually set up shop there in about June. And we spent five or six months just researching menu development, uh, testing, trialing things, you know, buying new ingredients, buying new plates, buying new equipment. Uh, um, Matilda in South Yarra is back to normal. That was open, as I said, aside from second lockdown, but that's hit its strides as well too. Um, long grain, we didn't open until the end of the second lockdown. We, we got the keys to that 1st of June. And then we just, we did a little bit of Providor stuff. Uh, you know, the takeaway didn't really work there in, in the CBD. We tried it for a week and it wasn't worth it. So we said, okay, yeah, let's actually just, you know, refine the product and get a really good understanding of the business in those three, four, five months that we kind of were closed. So then we, um, you know, we had new plates, maybe did a refurb in the kitchen, we, we did a slight refresh of the dining room. You know, we did 20 dishes now that are the kind of new long-range dishes that the boys, 
and I have worked on that are going to come out. So we keep the bones of the business, all those long grain classics, you know, the beetle leaf, the egg net, the crispy pork, the beef shin, everything I really learnt and understood Marty sort of, you know, sort of dishes and then how we could refine those or just make those a little bit better or just give them our own little touch. Um, and then Chancery Lane's, uh, that opened the week before Christmas. The builder was a little bit late. I don't like opening restaurants the week before Christmas. It was kind of slated to be November. But then as, you know, um, as Kate said earlier, there's a staff shortage and we had the team ready to go. So it was either put them on standby for six weeks or stay or wait till February. I was like, actually, let's just put this down to an opening cost and just get the wheels turning and get into a really good kind of soft launch kind of mode. So we looked at the restrictive of the numbers, the public holidays, Christmas period, and the CBD to say, okay, well, let's just have a nice four, five, six weeks just to get into the new home and find our feet a little bit. And that's worked really well too. So, I mean, you know, I, I visited the Melbourne CBD in December. I'm in, I'm in yeah. Docklands now, not, not a really long way from your building. We're a long, long, long way from, you know, peak, 2019 numbers yeah. in the CBD, particularly down this end of town. Yeah. What are you seeing? I mean, I, I'm very curious, Scott, and I'm going to pass the talking stick to these guys in a second, but because you have multiple businesses within Melbourne and because you've operated in the suburbs for so long, but you're also now heavily invested in CBD, what are, you, what are your observations about where the people are and where, where business is? Well, I haven't really spent much time in the CBD in the last 10 years. I've kind of enjoyed just hanging out in Northcote and being close to home and here and going to uh, and going to Crispin and Estee Lupo and the Matilda. So, you know, since June was really the first time that I'd spent any time there in 10 years. And I was a little bit nervous during that sort of mid-year <laughs> thing when there, when was there were no tumbleweeds no there. There, there was literally no one, like I'd, like I'd walk over to Burke Street and there would be a tram and tumbleweeds, like literally tumbleweeds going down Burke Street. There was zero. And I was like, oh. Geez, I've, I've made a good decision sure. opening a yeah, restaurant yeah, in yeah, CBD, you were thinking to yourself. <laughs> yeah. And then same as Gatsby <laughs> Lane. It's funny how, you know, the decisions that the government make can have almost instant, like almost instantaneous sort of effect where if you look prior to this five-day lockdown that we had, you know, the lunches were getting there. You know, there was a Friday lunch where we did 150 at Long Grain the week before, and then he has a like a press conference on the Wednesday, and then the Friday lunch we do 12, and then, then we're shut that Saturday night. And it's just crazy to see how people actually move and change just so quickly. You know, the Christmas at sort of Long Grain, we opened, I think, again, about the first week of November. You know, we had a great seven or eight weeks there pre-Christmas. And January, we always know, is going to be a bit softer. And February is kind of back to, well, what my sort of new normal is, in essence, there is, you know, 60 70% capacity most nights, full Friday, Saturday, and then the lunches are up and down. So I see the CBD coming back, obviously, at some stage, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months. Um, but I think that the Melbourne people will get behind it. I think the people are championing and at the bit to actually get out and dine and how long that sort of upside really lasts for is yet to be determined, but we'll see how it goes. Hey, what's the, I mean, with, with your businesses, both in the Melbourne CBD, but also in lawn, mm. when, when there is a, an event, like let's say the, the circuit breaker is, is lawn quicker to recover? Like, do you see that snap back or is it the same thing in, in off Linders lane as it is, out in the yeah. Regions. What do you observe? That's a really good question. Actually, um, lawn went really well because we were easily able to move all of our food and we didn't have any wastage. But the stress was suddenly because we also had Tonker at the NGV. Mm. So it was sort of we had about 12 hours to close four restaurants. And the amount of food wastage was, you know, front of mind for, for a lot of us. So we we're like, how many charities can we get this food to? And what can we do? Because we couldn't really sell the food in the traditional way that we had been because <clears throat> the dishes were all prepped. So all the fresh things we couldn't cry back like we'd been doing in takeaway. So there was a lot of food wastage, which was terrible because people couldn't get into the city with the 5K radius. So people co couldn't travel. And now because we've lost all of our bread and butter, which is the, you know, the financial group or the, or the business group, um, it was devastating really from a food waste perspective uh, so lawn was much better for that we could easily get rid of everything that there were there were more hungry people than we had food for 
And I mean, what are you encouraged now to look at more regional options? Like, are you thinking? Yeah. Oh my God. I that the regions are changed now. We've actually we've actually got a question from a member of the audience who is asking not so much about regions, but uh, Sophie from the audience is asking whether the feeling among you guys is that the the hot um, dining neighbourhoods in Melbourne will expand, you know, whether we'll see a broader definition away perhaps from the CBD or I'd, I'd like to think in addition to the CBD. I mean, yeah. do, does regional Victoria seem like a more viable proposition for the kind of restaurants that you run now? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think about this every single day. It's just particularly if I think about Portsy Sorrento, um, it's really crazy that, you, that there's really nowhere. I'm got to be a bit careful what I say here, but um, th there's, there's a lot of more. opportunity there. <laughs> and um, it just blows my mind. It blows my mind that there's not, I mean, there's a lot more as you sort of coming in 10, 10 by tractor and all those areas. That's amazing. But down here, there's so much space. People are starving for great food. And, and it's as simple as something as a little cafe or some great Japanese. You can't get a bowl of pasta in lawn. I'm scared to say that out loud, but you can't. Um, so if anyone's got any money. You should say it in Scott's hearing. They're like the weird, he's right in the town. You can see the pen hand. Going. Good. Oh, my God, Scott, we need you. I'll but, work for you just to get a bowl of pasta here. How do you, so there's opportunities, Kate, but, I mean. Huge. You began the conversation saying, you know, that, that there's some really significant challenges in the regions as well in that mm. it's very hard not just to find accommodation. <laughs> sorry, I beg your pardon, not just to find staff, but to even have staff to accommodate them. I mean, what's yeah. that? like so i'm currently living above cafe chaos which is a couple of doors down from ipsos on the main street so i'm super lucky but i'm sitting above the most awesome venue every day i walk past i'm like oh god it's just sitting there lonely with no food and no love and we would love to do something with it but there is literally no staff we've got five people on the roster including my husband and myself for a 120 seater like we are Just desperate, food. desperate, desperate. Like I, we, I, on one night I had three girls that had never worked a day in hospitality and two others had worked a couple of shifts at the MCG pouring beers. And I was like, oh, my God. What, I, went there's only... high, I went to a high profile regional uh, residency the other day and I said to the seasoned operators who are running it, this is great, but... These, uh, these people on the floor, have you just hired everyone who showed up and they were like... Literally. Yep. Literally. And and if they show up, if you can keep them to stay working, like the other night I think, I can't remember if it was Movita or the Bistro, but the two kitchen hands just walked out at quarter to seven. It, it wasn't busy yet, but they, were they, they literally just said, we're tired. I was like, what the fuck? You know, and that's happened to us. We've had three... It said. I was like, oh, my God, what is happening? So it's not only we'll hire anyone that turns up, but we just hope you'll stay for the entire shift. Like that, that's, the, that's a win right now. It's insane. Will you stop with these ridiculous standards? How is anyone going <laughs> to retain people with these bizarre rules? I think they just come it? for our staff meal and then they're out of here. <laughs> I mean, oh, what's going to happen though? I mean, what are you, you going to do? I don't know. What are you doing for staff? I mean, at Vex, you've got a relatively small restaurant. Are you just cooking everything? You and uh, Rory and is Owen the, doing the entire front of house team? Like, how are you working that? Uh, yeah, like, to be honest, that's pretty much the plan. Um, we, we do have is that. Is that baked into your business plan? I mean, yeah, yeah that's absolutely part of our business plan. Um, so we, we model ourselves, not in anything in particular, um, but more so on the concept that, Look, we're three pretty experienced young hospitality professionals. Um, we do know how to push pretty hard. And we figured that um, if we start with as little staffing as possible, that we can learn to see what it is that exactly that we need. Um, I think I'd say that one, one of the things that I noticed in one or two of the openings that I've done for other restaurants was the fact that you were opening with this grand staffing 
Because that is a thing, of course. Like you do see people who will just throw everything at the opening. Like we'll put on a million staff, and you know, and then we'll die. Within two months, you're shedding the team, and you're yeah. watching it slowly whittle away. And we always thought that that was probably not the type of thing that we're into doing. Um, we don't have the time to actually train that many staff members either, and we're so small. Let's just let's just let people see how hard we're running. You know, like, like make that part of our model. Um, you know, it, we, we do everything together anyway. You know, um, we talk menu, recipe developments. We talk wine together. Um, we clean the restaurant. We, we do everything. We just do everything. I do the book. I've just finished doing the books. Um, like it's, it's, everything is done by us. It's a total DIY aesthetic to it. What have you had to sacrifice, though, to achieve that? Like what just if, if we're, you know, there's plenty of people in the audience who are looking to open a restaurant, might be their first, might be their 10th. What, what does that model require? You know, something, you have to give something. What are you not doing to achieve that? Uh, this is it. This is pretty much it. Like you are, you're, you're plugged in, you know, like this is, this is what we wanted to do at the start you know it's about growing it's about it's about growth like and i think that if you want to do this kind of thing that you have to accept very much that if this is yours then you're just there and you're going to do everything and learn how everything goes until the moment where it's solid enough to start handballing bits and pieces off you know like does that affect your menu planning does that affect your style of service are you like no we're not going to do that like pour the thing on at the table thing we're not absolutely do- yeah yeah absolutely so the the way that we're currently set up, um, so we do have, we just got a full-time chef in this, we just got a full-time chef, which is amazing. And we have a part-timer on the floor as well. So in the kitchen, we don't have a kitchen hand. We don't use kitchen hands. Uh, we do all the dishes ourselves, polish everything ourselves. Everything gets done by us. Um, but I'll be running plates. I'll be pouring wine. I'll be going back in the kitchen to do dishes. I'll be plating. I'll do some cooking. I'll just do everything. We just do everything. That's it. And we wrote that in our plan initially, that this was what it was going to be. It was going to be three really hard owners, uh, working, hard working owners uh, with a couple of people there to help. And then we're just going to, we're going to let this organically grow, but we're going to start working so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, it's, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of hard work. You know, it's, 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 um, it doesn't sound like not a lot of work. Yeah. It's tiring. It's, it's definitely tiring, but like we knew that this is what we wanted to do. And we um, are trying to keep as much in the tank for the unknown as possible right now. You know, we can't overexpend and we never actually started with that much money anyway. Scott, I mean, we, when we were talking ahead of this, this session, I said to you, did you, did you build that in, you know, particularly with Chancery Lane, like, for, for someone who's sitting down at the kitchen table or with their financial advisor or with their mum and dad and a, a pencil and a back of an envelope to work out a P&L, what is a, what is a 2020 business plan look like now? How does it differ from business plans you might have written for restaurants you've opened in the past? Well, my first business plan when we sort of initially opened Estelle was pretty much the same as Flo's, to be honest. We'll kick the door in and we'll kill everyone and then we'll take all the money and run <laughs> yeah. out and laugh. Yeah, that's it. Just go hard <laughs> and that was it. There was two on the floor. There was me, Ryan, and one more in the kitchen. There was five of us and we did the same thing. There was a little undercounter dishwasher that in between I did the sauce, the pass, the fish, the veg. Ryan did larder and pastry and then we had a commie just running around after us in between and we're just I'd put loads of like of dishes through in between tables dressing plates running food there was only the front part of Estelle so there was only 28 seats with the bar and there was one behind the bar and then one working the sort of 10 tables and that that was it I fast forward 10 years later and what I've done another five six seven places along the way kind of thing and now with Chancery Lane, we really just built in a sort of contingency plan to our setup cost that when we decided, right, so, you know, it's going to cost us X amount and let's just whack another 25% on top of it that we know at some stage we're either going to take out of the business so that we're going to give back to the bank or that's just an it like an initial setup cost like we would have put it down to kitchen, down to front of house kind of plates or stock or whatever it is. It's just sitting there in case and that's to get us through the times that, you know, if we look, you know, to be completely transparent. So that's been open eight weeks now. We've 
we'll probably make a profit this week, I think, of probably about 1,500, 2,000 first week's profit back. Now, considering that the, you know, your total investment was in the millions there for the refurb, you know, that's, you know, that's 25 years to pay that back and it won't get that bad. But we knew that we were going to be losing a fair amount at the start with the variables of, of COVID, of the CBD of January. And so we really built that into what we were kind of expecting to, you know, just kind of recoup over a long period of time. Long grain, on the other hand, um, you know, you know, the two venues, both of them, I must like, I just want to say to be very clear with everyone listening and, and you guys as well too, is that John Van Handel and actually Shannon Bennett as well too were, you know, were such an amazing support to the me. previous through. owners of these two businesses. Yeah, yeah. And so John Van Handel was one of the partners in Long Rain and John and Lisa had had that, you know, for many years they were the final partners. And that really came about when I first heard about it. I was really, really sad. I didn't want to see Long Rain go. It, it, it's an institution. It was, you know, pre-Chin Chin, you know, first communal dining, you know, probably pre-Coda maybe as well too, I think even. It was kind of that yep. first big um, Thai sort of Asian style sort of restaurant um, that was out, that was run by, you know, by Australians as opposed to classic Thai people, you know, Marty Boats or people, you know, that's kind of Australian generation that have learnt Thai food that had an interest in Southeast Asia that had gone out and done that. Um, and it really just started because I called John to say, look, mate, it's terrible news. Anything I can do, rah, rah, we had a bit of a chat. And it's actually, have you got time for a walk and a, like, and a coffee? And so we met at Matilda. We did a lap of the tan by the time, you know, a slow walk, right? So it wasn't a run. It was a slow walk. So it took us half an hour. By the time, time we got back to Matilda, we'd kind of got to the stage that I wanted to see it exist for another 10, 15, 20 years that I wanted to, you know, take the mantle from John that I wanted to, you know, like actually keep that sort of restaurant alive and, you know, keep the people employed and, you know, re-employ the people and keep that long grain sort of heritage name, brand, the food, the vibe, the energy going. And John was a wonderful support for that too. And I suppose it was the same with the sort of Vicky Jimmy side. I've been speaking to Shannon already. That had been on and off the go for about 12 months. And then this kind of came to a head. And then I called Shannon. I said, mate, look, it's probably crazy. But I've always loved that space. I've always loved Normanby Chambers. I've had so many great meals there, whether it be at Vu or Bistro Vu or Ikijimi. It's a wonderful location. It's an icon, whether it was Voodamond or it's Chancellor now, whatever. That sort of location is an iconic, you know, for a restaurant site in Melbourne. So I said, look, I'd like to have a crack. And again, it was a great support with tenants, with landlords, with, you know, working through everything like that. So, you know, we're kind of lucky that, you know, we got some good rental incentives to kind of help out of COVID as well with this. You know, the landlords are really, you know, really supportive in both venues and so were the previous owners and tenants. So, you know, and there's... You, I think you've, you've mentioned to me before that you, you know, you signed on to two kitchens that were in very good nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that was a good save. It was good. They could have been... Look, if I was... If the bank wouldn't give me as much money now on loans as they did when I started with like at Flow 10 years ago, when I first started, they wouldn't give me 20 grand now, you know, with cash flow, they kind of fall over you a little bit. I'm like, you know, what if we owe 2 million or 10? The more we owe, the more chance we have of surviving because they're not going to come after me for like a huge amount of money. <laughs> so I kind of think the more that I owe the bank, you know, the stronger position I am to either waive some of the debt what's, or actually what's get What's the bill. line, Scott? If you owe the bank $100,000, it's your problem. But if, yep. you know, you owe the bank, bank. 10, that's their problem. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, and that's exactly right, Pat. And that's that's kind of how I saw it too. And not the Bank of Melbourne, I should Not point. the Bank of Melbourne. Definitely not the <laughs> Bank of Melbourne. Uh, definitely not the Bank of Melbourne. And I suppose it was uh, probably when COVID all hit and I got home, you know, one night and I was talking to my wife about this and this this kind of reality really hit that we could actually possibly lose everything that we have. You know, we mortgaged our house, you know, right to the hilt to finish Matilda, you know, because I didn't want to compromise on the standard or the fit out or anything. And, and, you know, we're all in, right? Everything's in. We go pear shaped. Then I pack up a suitcase and I'm out or I'm done. I move the country, go overseas or I find another job, right? That's it. And there was this feeling that, you know, we had this conversation when we spoke about, you know, actually taking, you know, doubling down twice again. And I said to my wife, Beck, I said, well, like, like I can work as hard as I can, but there's a chance that, that, you know, that this might be all taken away from us and it's completely out of my control. And there's nothing that I can do about it. I can work, we can do takeaway, we can pivot, we do all the, 
you know, all the special 2020 words or whatever, but it still might actually not even fucking eventuate. In that, Pat, I found an absolute freedom of no fear at all then because once you're standing on the cliff and you're like, well, I can fall or not or someone might push me, but it's still going to go or I'm still going to either, you know, jump with a parachute or fly. I said, actually, let's have a really, really good crack at two great places, two great businesses. You know, they could have both been turnkey if we wanted to. We were lucky that we could actually do a nice, you know, like a nice refurb at like a Chancery Lane. And Long Grain really didn't need much at all too. It's a great business, great bones. You know, we did some tables, some chairs, you know, bought the boys, a, you know, a few new toys in, in the kitchen. And it was nowhere near the expense that it would have been if we had have set that out pre-COVID, whereas Chantry Lane was probably on par with what a normal, you know, refurb would be. So there are already the bones there, you know. So, like, it was much easier in some ways just to really get the ball rolling and cash flow coming through to, you know, pay back the Bank of Melbourne. You know? is, that, is that the opportunity in 2021, Kate? I mean, we don't need to tell anyone about the challenges or the, the big challenge. Yeah. You know, we're in a pandemic still, but... Talk to me, you know, I, I want to get into this. What are my advantages right now as someone who's about to, you know, open something? Yeah, I think the advantages are huge. I've found the, the pandemic experience, like Scott's saying, it's been really Money's positive cheap. for me. Uh, yeah, there's there's things out there. I mean, it's sad. Like looking restaurants. for things to invest in, right? Yeah, looking for things to invest in. Something as simple as, you know, and you never want to think about this, but restaurants closing. And, and Scott, thanks so much for taking on Long Grain because, and also the view side, I used to work there. God, it's beautiful. But to have lost Long Grain would have been just terrible for, for Victoria and Australia. It's so special and thank you. But, uh, you know, I know of a couple of restaurants that are not okay at the moment and they are treasures, so if we can try and protect these treasures, if there's any way that anyone out there can try and save and, and do what Scott did and actually try and keep those very special um, places alive, that would be incredible. But things like restaurants that are closing or perhaps that, you know, never might never have survived, um, but si since the pandemic didn't survive, you know, there's a lot of cheap furniture out there. Mm -hmm. go and go and get a warehouse somewhere far away and put a whole lot of cheap chairs furniture is so expensive fit out is what I really like to do and it kills me every time I cannot believe how expensive it is so there's kitchen equipment you can get combi ovens so there's a lot of physical stuff that takes the significant amount of your budget away so if you know I think it's just starting to have a look around at that and keeping your eye open for opportunities of restaurants that need a hand. Perhaps you could go in with them. Perhaps you could become a, a partner. Perhaps you could bring something to that that might keep, provide an opportunity for you both. Um, but I just feel like this year, while it's going to be challenging, it's just very exciting about what we can or what's ahead, really. That's how I'm feeling. I feel this year is really exciting. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, of course, you, you mentioned that you opened Coda in, in a recession and so many of our great restaurants of the last sort of um, 15 years actually opened in that time because yeah, in adversity there is opportunity. It's a, it's a cliche, but it's true. And yeah. I, just this, this one more than anything has forced everyone to think a little bit differently about how they can work. Um, mm. Just to get really down to brass tacks, you know, some, some, flags, some green flags. I mean, what are some things you absolutely need to have considered, Kate, before you plonk down any money, before you take the plunge? Like yep. people are just like, bugger it, let's just do it. Yeah, woo. And that's <laughs> But are there a few things there, particularly Definitely. 21, that you would think if you do this, you will give your fledgling business a better shot at survival? Absolutely. For me, the number one most important thing is recognise your weaknesses. So sit down with whoever you're in business with and say, right, yes, we all know that we can physically clean a restaurant. We all know that we can figure out how to format a menu somehow. We might not want to do it, but what can you absolutely not do? And I cannot have no idea. I sit there month in, month out and look at the P&Ls and the balance sheets and I'm like, but I pretend that I know, but I have got no idea. So it's, it's essential that we pay somebody that does know what they're doing. Fortunately, my husband knows quite well what he's doing. I have got no idea. So if that's not your area, you need to know, 
day to day how you're going financially because if you wait a month you can be in the shit before you've realized it it's got to be an ongoing analysis by people that actually understand that so get a really good accountant talk to friends that are in the industry that maybe have got an accountant in saying that though we did um God, we found the most beautiful girl and she really became like our friend, our family, and she stole, you know, a hundred grand from us. And don't get her. Don't get her. Um, but but what, I wish so I do, wish you were the only person to have told me a story about like that in Australian hospitality, Kate. Oh my God. So. It's wild. So so get so get someone good and then get someone to double check the work. Because if you can't have you know, it's business, you've got to have some kind of financial security and someone has to be looking out for that for you if that's not your area and it certainly isn't mine. That's my number one tip. So what do you reckon? What do you what do you think you don't need to spend money on? What have you found at VEX that you've seen at other places you've worked that for the moment while you are running the tightest of tight ships you can actually just do without? Um, look, we've done without a lot of stuff, to be fair. We are we're probably, we probably opened with about a third of the amount of refrigeration that we needed. Um, you know, we, we made do, but we also work, I just remember we had to work fresh every single day. Sure. I remember the, the, the Bill Granger myth, you know, uh, Sydney's proudest Melbourne born food talent. I mean, the, the whole Bill's thing came from the fact they had no fridges and his whole menu came about because they just had to get stuff in cook it and get it out and that was the style of their food so yeah look it's uh, look it's i'm not i'm not recommending it particularly um <laughs> the situation is life good. could be easier life could definitely be easier but no like uh we we were we didn't go crazy on expenditure on equipment let's put it that way what didn't um, you buy we don't we, look we, we're just about to buy an ice machine i can't wait to not have to go on <laughs> every single day i'm really looking forward to that um so we didn't get the ice machine we uh we didn't get the extra fridge or two that we needed um we haven't upgraded the dishwasher which would be lovely you know um we have we managed to pick up a business for basically the dollar value because old mate wanted to get out of there real bad um so we basically looked at what was in there initially and went savable savable two to five years, uh, at least the first year. And kind of from that, just went, right, we just need to get going, you know? We just need to get going. And we can, we know in ourselves, and I think you were just asking one of those things, the green flags, the things you absolutely need to have. You, you need to be so confident in your own skill set, Like just generally, like you are the most important wage in that business. Um, you don't want to be paying other people to be doing a lot of the day, <coughs> uh, I think especially right now, like it's, you got to be there hands on. So right now we're at that point, we've just managed to see that we're sort of ticking along quite nicely. We can see it's sort of growing. And now we start to make the little purchases, you know, along the way, the purchases we did make were the finishing touches. We got some nice tabletops made and you know, we got, we got some nice glassware. You know, it's the stuff that you're going to be holding in your hand to feel the quality of the, you know, the environment and, and the experience. But the other stuff behind the scenes, you know, it's like the old duck, duck swimming on water, you know, calm as anything, but peddling like hell underneath. You know, that's, that's kind of the ethos we're going with. Just, just to swerve for a second, Flo, I mean, when we were talking uh, before, the, before we got onto this here webinar, um, you mentioned that in 2021, or, you know, in pandemic life, there were some assumptions that you guys had made about maybe how people were going to behave, customers were going to behave that didn't bear out in reality. Do you want, do you want to just wave, wave those flags there for some of your colleagues who <coughs> encountered this with businesses of their own? Yeah, I look, oh, because maybe it was partially naive, you know, it's like that long sort of period of not having restaurants and, you know, to a degree, it was, it was true that like when we managed to open up and noticing it around town as well, that people just were so happy to be out, to be dining and drinking again, not be cooking for themselves or, you know, drinking at home. Um, and we sort of thought that maybe that the general sort of consensus would be that there'd be a little bit more of that respectfulness towards restaurant bookings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're pretty wrong on that, to be fair. 
um it's just it's just carried on you know but no shows no shows are as much a part of 2021 no shows, as no they shows. were a part of every other year in restaurant life in victoria yeah look we're we're, we're running at you know two-thirds three-quarter capacity inside but you know it's, you still get tables big tables cancelling 24 hours out you know and for a small venue like us we obviously don't have quite the biggest pool yet but um you know a table of let's put it this way let's a table of 15 to us is everything that is just next level to have something like that you know cancel and not communicate with you earlier in the week a day or two before that really does wreck a Saturday night very quickly you know it's a small little bits and pieces and we did definitely think that the general public and the sort of dining public would get a little bit more respectful in that way but don't expect it you know I think that's the most important thing so whether it's any sort of conditions just you know hope for the best but prepare for the worst i think what we we wanted to open up and be an all-inclusive venue that you don't feel like is going to be some type of um you know it's not a massive deal if you book with us you know it's like you're gonna come you, you didn't want to like, ask for a blood sample and everyone's made yeah, pretty much pretty much no so things, manners and nothing like that but um you know at this point in time it's like well getting burnt on a pretty regular basis now you go right are we going to start asking for credit card details at, for every booking because yeah those minimums need to be kept you know and there's no way to recoup a lot of it in, in that moment you know it's hoping question for the floor from the audience um if you're not an established restaurateur how do you convince the bank or prospective mm. landlords to give you a venue or give you some money in 2021? Yeah, that's great a really question. Good, yeah, no, that's a great nothing. question. Look, it's not, yeah, you know, when I say help, it's more about the support to actually sort of, you know, give you, you know, give you an opportunity, really. If you look at, you know, a flow, it's probably the same as a landlord there. You know, the way that I see the market at the moment too, that is, if you've got a good sound business plan, if you've got enough capital that the banks, you know, the bank's going to support you whether, you know, we're in 2020, you know, um, we're in 2019, probably a bit different last year, but this year, like in, like if you're in 2021 or 2022, at some point, if the numbers add up with what you're willing to risk and go in and the bank's going to give you the same or 30% or enough or wherever that is, then and it's going to be viable. The economy has to keep moving on. You know, landlords is, you know, when I talk about opportunity, there's lots of, of like, like there's lots of vacant sites out there that you can drive around and see where landlords are going broke. They want to fill it with a tenant. Right. And if you've got a good business model, good business plan, if you've got enough working cap that you think that, right, I was going to do this last year or a year before, or I think that I could do it in six months time. And you have a good, honest conversation with the landlord or with your bank manager that they're probably going to support you. Do you know what I mean? It's I think that, you know, you know, like um, in the early days to actually open a style, I had an investment property that I actually bought with my redundancy money from Paul Bacuse in 1994. So I had a flat that I bought in Kensington and I was 22 at the time when we were made sort of redundant before Langton's and, and it was quite a bit of money actually. And I was, you know, like fuck most young 22 year olds, I was going to go overseas, go wild, you know, and I decided to invest it in a property. Now that was probably the best thing that I did, but for me to start a style, like I had to risk that property, sign everything that I had and then put that in the pot. Now, if you're not willing to risk that, then the bank's not going to give you anything. If you're not going to say, right, I've got some investors, some partners, or, you know, if there's something that you're going to put in, that, you know, that you're actually willing to risk. And, you know, that's what business is. It's all about risk, really. It's risk and reward. And whether that be through hard work, whether that be through, you know, doing things yourself or sort of however that works, it's not just, okay, I'm going to get this for free, free, free. I still had to put a huge amount of money and sign over everything that I had for long grade and chance land as well too, right? The risk just multiplies. You know, the equity in my house gets smaller, smaller, smaller. So now actually I own about 2% of my first line. Now I'm hoping at some point I'll recoup that in a five to 10 year period and it'll be okay. But yeah, I think there are some good conversations to be done out there if you are looking or if you were in conversation already with a landlord or a tenant, that you might get a little bit more of a better deal because they might, you know, you might say, look, I'm going to take this on board, but I might not want a five-year lease. I might want a two-year lease at the start 
or I might want to have better options because I'm going to actually commit now and I don't just want a five-year lease, but I want to have the options of, um, of you know, three years, then five, then five, then five, then five, if I'm going to invest. Now, the landlord might not have done that a couple of years ago. Now they're looking for someone to, you know, to paint their buildings, to clean it out, to pay rent sort of week to week. And same as the banks. If you've got a good business case, you know, and you've actually put in sort of some sort of projection for the downturn that might occur, and you think you can ride that wave up and down, then they're probably going to give you a hand. I've got to be honest in the uh, the period that we've been in, I haven't from a single bank manager or anybody offering that nothing, nothing from banks, absolutely nothing from yeah. banks for a new, without any trading history. Yeah. Uh, like I'll be honest for yeah. anybody, anybody asking who wants to go from, from zero. Uh, yeah. Have not heard a single thing from any bank about any, any money that we could ever get. Uh, the only thing we've been offered is that sort of tertiary loans, which means pretty high interest. Yeah. Um, and some pretty, well, I don't know if you could call it that trustworthy, but, um, maybe some equipment finance, if you're lucky, is what you might manage to manage to find for somebody who's coming from zero, um, is, is in my experience anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. What, do you, what do you recommend for someone in the same position as you, Flo? Look, um, Get together a bunch of mates who have money that's going nowhere and say, yeah. take Look, it we, we spent pretty much the, 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 our own money um, on what we had to do to set up. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take a personal loan which is basically our security to open with. Yeah. Um, that yeah. is what we're at at this point in time. And that's the reason why we're running as tight as we are. Mm. That's, that's, the, that's the black and white of our business right now is that you know, we, we don't have very much at all. Mm. Um, but we also know that we don't need that much to make this place run so far. So that's kind of just about the balance. And yeah, I mean, like just personally, if, if, <laughs> if people are, are expecting to go to a bank and get money out of them, yeah, I've definitely talked to four or five of them. Um, not really for, for anybody without a trading history right now. It's, yep. like, it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight. I, I oh, oh, you go, Pat. Hey, please, no, I was go just going to say, if you, if you, we, when, we, when we first opened Coda, we had no money and we got a bank loan and then the recession hit and they withdrew everything that we'd signed on. So we had to self-fund every single dollar. We didn't get a single dollar from the bank. And I, I, still now I cannot stand the banks. And I tell, we tell them that I say, you guys are bullies and you're fucked. And I tell them often, they don't like me at all. But I think we as restaurateurs that now have got a bit of a relationship with them need to call them out. It's the way that they treat people. They bully you. It's not on. If you can possibly get your money somewhere else, I mean, you're going to have to bring your own money in somehow through savings. But if you can find a friend or somebody that's got some money, and you're going to have to pay them back at a high, high interest rate. That's just a fact. But I think that's a much better way to go than you just can't get money from banks in those early days, I don't think. Um, exactly the same, Kate and Flo. I mean, the only reason the bank gave me anything was because I'd had that property tucked away for 15 yeah. years. Yeah. And yeah. it was worth a couple of hundred grand and they yeah. mortgaged me up to 80% of it. And then they said, okay, you get that to start. And I think it was 150 or 160,000. Yep. They gave me off that, but I've basically been saving that through, you know, rent and mortgage payments I've made myself for 15 years. And then I'm like, yep. right, that's all we've got. It was the same, you know, thing as if three guys are putting in 50K or whatever it's in. It's like, yep. like there was no more after that, you know, that was it. And that's exactly why, like Estelle started the same way. And it was only with trading history now that we're able, you know, 10 years in that we're able to kind of do the things that we did. But if you can, and I agree with Kate too, I've had huge amounts of problems with the banks over the years, you know, but I think that Pat's right that if you owe them 100K, you know, yeah. if you owe them a bit more, they don't actually want to see you fall. So that's probably worked in our advantage now. Whereas yeah. definitely 10 years ago, you know, they wouldn't give me five bucks more than what it was on the mortgage, the percentages where it was at, you know, your leverage is no more equity. I'm like, well, you know, you can't give us another 10 grand or five grand or we need an ice machine or something or whatever. But um, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. But yeah, that changes throughout time, I suppose, as you go. But the banks are still just as hard to work with now. It's just the numbers just get bigger, but it's still the same percentages, you know? Yeah. We are going to have to draw a line under it there, uh, team. I think this has been a great, great session. And I, I thank you for your, for your candor. Um, I'd also like to thank the sponsor of this series, Mr. Yum. Uh, the guys at Mr. Yum have actually, you probably would have seen it on your registration email, but they actually sent through a whole bunch of their 
uh, resources uh, that they've compiled around um, opening new venues and around operating hospitality venues yourself. So check that out or hop onto the Mr. Yum website. I'd also like to thank the festival's principal partner, Bank of Melbourne, and our destination partner, Visit Victoria, for their support throughout the year and in general. I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists, Florian Ribble, Scott Pickett, and Kate Bartholomew. Thank you guys, you've been incredible. Um, I'd like to say thank you for everyone, to everyone for joining us. This is the first of 12, 11, a year's worth of these conversations. Uh, frank, uncensored and free flowing, um, designed to assist anyone who's interested in hospitality um, in Victoria in making a fist of it, learning more and being the best you can be. If you've got some ideas that you'd like us to discuss later this year or some people you'd like to see in these sessions, drop me a line. I'm easy to find or just email us at the festival or tag us on social. Um, why don't we close with a very brief shout out from each of you, the number one thing, make, let's make it short and sharp, the number one piece of advice you got for someone opening a restaurant for themselves in 2021, Flo. Uh, number Just one, when you thought you're off the hook. Yeah, no, right? <laughs> I'm hoping you're gonna give somebody else a chance first. I'm good to um, go. Kate. I'll just go first, Kate. I think make sure that you enjoy it and you love it because you're going to, it's bloody hard work and that's number one. Just do it because you love it and because you couldn't do anything else. Boom. I'm all go. <laughs> so work, yeah, work hard, yeah, take risk and back yourself. Oh, Flo, this is a hard act to follow. You should have gone first. No, I know. <laughs> Be creative about it, you know. Um, really stretch your sort of horizons on things. Try and look at it from every angle. You'll always find a way through, I think. Fantastic. And I would say one thing that actually each of you has said to me in, in the conversations I've had with you before the call, you're in Victoria, ask for help. People will help you. There are other people in the trade and I would say possibly more than anywhere else in Australia and certainly more than most places in the world. If you need help, this is Victorian hospitality. People are here to help you ask and you will receive. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Pat Nurse. This has been the first of 2021's Melbourne Food and Wine Festival Industry Forums. I'm now going to do a slightly awkward thing where I pull a face while I turn off the Zoom. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks, Pat. <laughs>